Uncle Doug. Hello, Uncle Dan. Uh, listen, uh, we, uh, as our listeners know, mm. if there's one thing you can say about our show, it is that we are scientific geniuses. Absolutely. Uh, we have uncovered such scientific truths as uh, Lemuria <laughs> and uh, and uh, Atlantis, I think, maybe we've uh, we talked. haven't done Atlantis yet, but we did do Tuning Fork uh, Woo. Tuning that's forks. true. Yep. So yeah. that's, there, uh, that's, there are more PhDs on this show than there are in all of Trump University. <laughs> uh, in that there are none. <laughs> right, right. Yes. Right. Except Jill Biden, are, who must not ever use that title because gross. Does, do any of us actually have a degree? I do. Doug oh, okay. Does. Mm-hmm. Oh, Doug. That's cute. My husband <laughs> gives me the third degree every time I come home with someone else's perfume on. <laughs> perfume. perfume. Lipstick on your collar. <laughs> with, yeah, I know. On. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, so, Uncle Mark, are you going to impart some uh, some science on us? Yeah, gonna... so let's, 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 you know, as always, the, the little disclaimer up front. Uh, I am not a real science talking guy. I am an art school dropout who ran away and joined the movie circus. <clears throat> but, you know, I, science is one of my interests. And uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say hobby. But I do pay attention to it, and uh, every once in a while I go, fuck. And this is kind of one of those moments, so let me let me guide you into it. <laughs> so you know, fellas, last week we had some fun and some laughs at the expense of some of the UFO cultists mm. before wrapping around and realizing that there is a north of zero chance that not only are we not alone in the galaxy, but also that visitors from beyond may already know about our noisy little planet and all our goings on here. And, you know, north of zero. So yeah. I forgot to mention that in that Washington Post article I cited discussing some potentially unnerving evidence of of, the, uh, of this, it also quoted an interview of almost former President Donald Trump by distinguished journalist Donald Trump Jr., in which Sr. claimed to know some very interesting things about the UFO incident in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. <laughs> Which instantly disproves the government knows anything about UFOs at all, because if they told Trump anything about it, he would have tweeted it all out 15 seconds later or sold it to Putin. Right. Like he does everything else, right? Or at very least, we have enough smart people in the government who were able to keep it from him. Right. He never made it to Area 51, probably. (laughs) Because they don't have a golf course. Well, yeah. I mean, they they could just fly him around in a circle three times and land him in the same place and tell him it was Area 51. Yeah, he doesn't fucking know. (laughs) Um, But for serious whether they were kooks or not, what those UFO cultists were doing was not only searching for the meaning of life, but like every other religious movement ever, and obviously science, they were reaching to understand life's origins. Get laid. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and, Re- exactly. Reaching to the origins, right. And I think that's something the vast majority of our listeners and the majority of the skeptical podverse is also looking to do, you know, is to understand the origins of life. Sure. So now every culture has an origin story of human beginnings, a creation myth, if you will. Uh, The one in the Christian world, of course, where we three live, uh, sadly or otherwise, is that about 6,000 years ago, a very powerful God uh, set a calendar week aside to make the universe and everything in it, including people, which he first did by blowing into mud nostrils and then inexplicably did a do-over a few short lines later when he made a guy, then tore his rib out to make a rib lady to be his friend. Um, to have sex with, even though she was genetically his twin. Um, most other culture... More co- of a clone, really. A clone, which is kind of a twin, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Same genes, different. Every, same everything. But <laughs> most, most other cultures' creation myths, however, are stupid and unbelievable by comparison. So Right. But again, they're all trying to answer the gnawing question, where did we come from? And I, for one, am willing to listen to any reasonable explanation. Uh, and uh, just an aside, you guys, not, you guys know that oddly, we haven't really made a, a specific column in our spreadsheet for creation myths, oh. hmm. which is kind of um, uh, an oversight, I think, because some of them are really fantastic. <clears throat> There's a That's lot of true. really fun. I've, I started looking into the Navajo creation myth at one point, and my brain started bleeding. It was so complicated. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll have a Navajo on to talk about that sometime. Um but anyway, we, let's let's resolve to change that and do that in the future. <coughs> yeah. Now, on the scientific side of the ledger, the search for answers to this big one rolls on. <clears throat> uh, abiogenesis broadly is what we call the beginnings of life on Earth, or how we you know how we think maybe life formed from organic uh, organic compounds in a rather shockingly fast order after the formation of the Earth. 
The earliest microfossils found so far are almost 4 billion years old, uh, a short 500 million years after the formation and cooling of the planet. And there are uh, bacterial colony fossils called stromatolites from three and a half billion years old that are more complex. Three and a half billion years ago in the fossil record that are more complex. And those fossils are evidence of replicating organisms that used RNA, the precursor to DNA. And what is likely to save us from the virus, by the way, RNA research. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, meaning they have been evolving for quite some time prior to their evidence in the strata. So I know 500 million years is a long time, but to me, that's pretty fucking amazing that life started its struggle that quickly after this thing, you know, formed into a big space burger of rock and lava. So it's not just the anti-scientific minds of orthodox religion and the religion averse minds of science that have struggled with this. Perhaps the greatest question. Uh, science fiction has taken a few stabs at the question as well. Most cogently to our discussion, a really excellent film called The First 30 Minutes of Prometheus um, started off with what looked uh, clearly like a primordial Earth being visited by a humanoid being ev uh, who was even paler than Doug, who ingests a cup of glop that dissolves him into molecules. And as we follow his disintegration into the waterfall, we see strands of DNA in the roiling waters. Thus, he has seeded the, uh, the inert Earth <coughs> with the building blocks of life. Others, Fun. Yeah. Uh, why he couldn't just, you know, jerk off into the waterfall, I don't know. He just had to dissolve, but there you go. It's a priesthood. I'm melting off. Other stories have explored this idea, including, uh, for Doug here, uh, season six, episode 20 of Star Trek, The Next Generation, title The Chase, <laughs> where Captain Picard discovers that all humanoid life, human, Vulcan, Romulan, and yes, even Klingon is related. This is the concept of panspermia. In uh, scientific and theoretical terms, the idea that life on Earth may not have started here, <clears throat> but rather traveled here by coincidence or otherwise from outside our little planet. Now, while that's a really cool narrative for speculative fiction, it's a pretty absurd concept, right, guys? I mean, no one in their right mind would believe that kind of moonshine, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, that's what I thought too. <laughs> but I started poking around and it you, turns you'll out- You'll notice that neither of us responded to that. We <laughs> well, see your tricks coming, my friend. You, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have just so many tricks in my witch bag. But uh, while the theory of life spreading between planets uh, or even across the galaxy is a bit of a minority position among legit scientists, there are legit scientists that believe, some of them strongly, that it may be a provable hypothesis. The idea has been around in one form or another as far back as ancient Greece. It, it reemerged uh, as a seri kind of serious theory in the early 20th century, but picked up steam when uh, in the 70s <clears throat> when legit scientists Fred Hoyle and Chandra uh, Wikra Wikram Singh, Wikrama Singh, sorry, I murdered that name, proposed that space was littered with organic particles and that they rained down on Earth constantly. They were later proved correct. Uh, the idea is that tiny molecules are pushed through space uh, and, and or tiny little organic molecules and compounds are pushed through space by radiation pressure, potentially traveling hundreds of millions of miles in the 10 billion years since the Big Bang. Uh, this idea is called radiopanspermia. Mm. Um, in 2009, Stephen Hawking, who we mentioned last week, declared it very possible that life has been transmitted through space from planet to planet from high energy impacts on life-rich planets, jettisoning uh, organism-bearing rock as meteors that travel uh, through space to other planets at high speeds. This is called lithopanspermia, <clears throat> so being transported by rocks, right? Mm. But the question is then, how can organisms live in the freezing, highly radioactive vacuum of space? Um, pretty well, it turns out. <laughs> Experiments by NASA and the Japanese and European space agencies have shown that with even a tiny bit of dust or soot shielding, some bacteria can survive for years in the vacuum of space, or if shrouded enough by rock, indefinitely. Wow. Um, in 2019, scientists discovered ribose, a sugar molecule, in a meteorite. Uh, and that's an excellent building block for life. Interesting. So... Four real scientists and professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School, Gary Rovkin, very consciously wanders right up to the edge of the creationist argument while totally rejecting it, 
by arguing that 3.5 billion year old bacteri uh, bacterial stromatolite fossils are too complex given the short amount of time from planetary cooling to whatever mechanisms brought about their abiogenesis. He specifically points to something called the ATP synthase. <clears throat> and that's the same little wonder creationists often cite to argue the same thing as Ruvkin, but from a God made it position. Right. Uh, again, I'm not the best science talking guy, but apparently this is a, a little rotary mechanism that moves so quickly and is so elegantly efficient uh, Ruvkin argues it needed more time to develop than the considerably less than 500 million years it would have had on a cooling Earth. He suggests its evolution began much, much longer ago than 4 billion years someplace else. So <clears throat> apparently NASA has this cool thing they call the Decadal Survey. So every 10 years, they speak to all the leading astrophysicists and uh, astronomers and planetologists in the world and ask what the prior priorities of the next 10 years ought to be. Mm. And looking for life on other planets always ends up being the top priority. Hmm. Interesting. So it seems Ruvkin, who is a real scientist, and planetary scientist Maria Zuber <clears throat> have convinced NASA to include a small DNA sequencer on its next probe to Mars uh, in order to see if we can find proof of distant cousins on our nearest neighbor. Since the Curiosity rover has twice discovered methane there, uh, a very promising sign of bacterial life, Having the ability to detect microorganisms and see of what sort they are seems like a no-brainer. But if, as Ruvkin says, we see a similar method of replication as the RNA or DNA that is the coding for life on Earth, boom, panspermia seems pretty close to being a real thing. Um, so that would be kind of an earth-shattering thing to wrap our heads around, would it not? I mean, yeah, it'd be weird. What's funny is that... Uh, it doesn't change our theory of life. It just moves it, changes that's the exact, location. That's exactly right. And that's what a lot of these scientists say is it's like, we, we aren't really solving the problem of abiogenesis. We're just moving it. Yeah. But it's still fascinating. It's, it, it would be the- That's true. Yeah, right? Yeah. But as staggering as that might be to find that stuff on Mars, that's just transmission, potential transmission from one close planet to another you know, that's basically conjoined twins on the, on the galactic scale. Uh, and it would prove one of four things, that two similar forms of life arose coincidentally on two separate planets, which seems fairly unlikely, <clears throat> that life somehow migrated from Earth to Mars, that life migrated from Mars to Earth, or that both were seeded with bacterial life already in progress from somewhere else. And the minority of scientists who support panspermia seem to lean on a much, much bigger story. Um, in November of 2017, the first known, emphasis known, interstellar visitor to our solar system, but in no way the first ever, called uh, Oumuamua, passed at a pretty fast clip through our solar system. Um, it's Hawaiian for scout because it was discovered by the people at the observatory in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm. Um, and some speculate this elongated, very strange object was a spacecraft. Scientists, however, that got a closer look uh, assure us that it's a, a natural object of some kind. Sure it is. But yeah, it, it's a weird shape. But it's at its weird. speed, even if it's been traveling for only 20 to 40 million years, it could have come from light years away. And as I said, it surely cannot be the first such visitor given the billions of years before there was anybody to take note of such things, right? Right. The larger theory of panspermia <clears throat> holds that the same building blocks of life or even early microorganisms may have been seeded across the galaxy. And that brings us back to the Prometheus idea, uh, which is basically called by the scientific community directed panspermia, meaning someone somewhere way the fuck out there is essentially trying to colonize the universe but rather than with little green men in, in helmets with ray guns, they're playing the long fucking game. They're throwing bottles full of microbes into an infinite ocean, hoping a few can survive the journey, the planetary reentry, the impact and whatever the conditions on the ground are, and hoping a fistful of germs can turn into something more over unimaginable spans of time. For what purpose? Who can say? So I, I watched a lecture by another legitimate scientist, Robert Zerbin, uh, who thinks directed panspermia is a real possibility, uh, as did Nobel Prize winner and co-discoverer of DNA, Francis Crick. 
Um, furthermore, yeah, is there... again, to what end? That's so weird to me. Like, well, it's you're... it's a big question, isn't it? Like, <laughs> So furthermore, Zerbin thinks that because we ourselves as humans are now capable of it, that we should do it. <laughs> oh, really? oh my God. Yeah. That we no, that should sounds terrible. That we should send out shielded payloads of bacteria to our to our closest neighbors and again, playing the long game, even further out into that infinite ocean, hoping one day, likely after we're long gone, something like our ancient cousins will crawl along the surface of a world we'll never know. And I think there are huge ethical considerations around such an idea. Yeah. But it's interesting to consider nonetheless. And Zerbin uh, ends his lecture with a pretty <clears throat> concise little coda. He says, only parents have children. Um, <laughs> so that's the silly but also amazing and freaky and also very remotely possible idea of panspermia, guys. That's the, crazy. Look, the whole point <laughs> of like evolutionary theory, even if it came from somewhere in outer space is that at some point a child happened without a parent like yes. literally everybody has to concede that so i i, I quibble with everything i'm yeah. quibbling it's it, it see i thought it was just uh f you know fodder for science fiction and ufo kooks right so it was you know as i was reading for last week's um segment and started seeing that you know there were these truly legit scientists who have gone so far as to convince NASA to send a DNA sequencer to Mars that believe this is a possibility. I was like, shit, that's kind of crazy. I have no problem believing that there's life elsewhere. I, like, yeah. or at least at the least Drake in equation the and the Fermi paradox address that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's entirely possible, but <clears throat> it, it is interesting. I watched this great documentary on uh, the Cassini probe. Um, like maybe it was a Nova or something. And it's, you know, it was just fantastic. Um, it gave us so much science and so many images. I think it was Saturn, right? Was, I think Cassini Saturn, was yeah, Cassini. Saturn based. And when they, it finally had kind of gone well past its service date. So they decided to intentionally crash it, right? Right. And they were very, very careful to make sure that it went at a particular angle into the atmosphere of Saturn. So it would be completely destroyed up by entering it rather than coming in contact with one of Saturn's moons where there may be some kind of life. Um, because yeah. they were very intentionally were like, we don't want to expose, you know, there's, there, there could be a surviving microbe from Earth on that thing. Yeah, yeah. and they had to, the, the, what they, <clears throat> that, that probe had a probe of its own, if you remember that. Uh, yeah. That dropped onto uh, Titan. One of the one? moons, yeah. yeah. And the, the, what they had to do to clean that to the, their satisfaction was pretty intense. Um, yeah. Even then, they were very afraid that, like, no matter what you do, these microbes are so hardy. Right, and I uh, found in my reading that the NASA has discovered there are some strains that that their protocols don't kill. Right, the the, the tardigrades. Well, and tardigrades tar are, are they, they, <laughs> that's one of the things people are talking about shooting out into space. Yeah, well, for for oh. human panspermia, so. All I can say is I, 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 I hold with Monty Python and I say, pray that there's intelligent life somewhere out in space because there's bugger, bugger all down here on <laughs> Earth. Fuck all here on Earth. So anyway, panspermia, it's probably true. Bro, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, not sure. Sure I, I, I'm not sure I love the idea of basically sending plague blankets out to the universe, but that's me. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we'll exactly. see what happens. Like, there's, other li there's already life going on on some planet. We just send this fucking virus yeah. there. You're welcome. <laughs> Here, have, have one of these. We don't know what it'll do. You Guys, don't know I think... who we are. We don't know what this will do. Good luck. I think so. we might be the villains. Yeah, yeah. We're the, bad we're the space we the baddies. baddies? <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, moving on. Moving on. 